Ed Tech Weekly 208. It's January 15, 16, 2012. I'm John Schinker in Stowe, Ohio. This is Dave Cormier in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. Jeff Lebo in Pusan, Korea, and we are standing by for Dr. Jennifer Madrill to join us from Internet Challenge World. She's having some disk error issues. Just because her hard drive died up. five minutes before uh, we started here? Yeah, uh, likely story. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. How's everybody Happy doing? Oh, things are very exciting. Very exciting around here. Tis a year of transition for you, Dave. You'll be beginning the year of the dragon in a new abode. I will be. I will be. Very much a year of transition all around, I think. For me, the um, I've decided to, to spend a little bit more time focusing on my research this year and a little bit less time doing a little um, sort of broad commentary. And I'm trying to focus down and sort of get the whole rhizomatic learning thing finished if that makes any sense which it probably doesn't um it may end up what are you thinking by finished what does finished mean well george taunted me um in back in november and was suggesting that the whole rhizomatic learning thing made sense as long as it was kind of a story but if you know if you took it seriously it didn't really hold up um which coincidentally is exactly the way i feel about connectivism um so (laughs) I've decided that I'm going to spend a little bit more time working through the details, uh, particularly of the work that I've done um, in the course that I teach here for the Faculty of Education, um, which has gone in for review. Um, The course that no one has ever really seen the syllabus for and nobody really knows what I'm doing in that course, well, it just went to the curriculum consultants on the weekend. So we'll see how that goes. I have to defend it in a week and a half. Does that Um, mean you had to write a curriculum for it? Well, I sent them the syllabus. Uh, no, I'm okay. not going to write a curriculum. It wouldn't make any sense. Uh, Community is the curriculum, right? Right. So, yeah. That well, that was the question: is how do you define yeah, that? Yeah. It, and you know, yes, I'm giving you a hard time, but also no, no, uh, no, on I a don't. serious note, how do you make these ideas fit within the traditional structure of higher education? Which is something and that's, we've been struggling with on the MOOC side as well. Absolutely. And the thing that I've come to terms with is that my interest in this is actually not rhizomatic learning, but rhizomatic education. Um, the, I got asked for a conference title um, for a presentation I'm doing in about a month and a half, a presentation title, and I sent back um, rhizomatic learning embracing um, uncertainty for formal education. And I think what I'm trying to do is trying to make the argument for formal ed, not for informal ed. Um, because the informal education isn't really an argument. You know, that stuff's already happening. And it's the sort of thing that doesn't require um, the same amount of policy work. It doesn't require the same amount of subtle argument because realistically, informal learning is called living. Um, And and, uh, while that is interesting, it's not a change action. Um, Whereas trying to make the argument for the way that I do teach informal education and trying to develop some kind of structure that would allow it to be ratified by a university uh, is of great interest. So that's sort of um, my focus for this year. All right, I have more follow-up questions about that, but I'm thinking it would be nice to go around and maybe share our 2012 goals and transitions and welcome Dr. Jennifer to the conversation. Asterix, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Asterix. Yay, yay. Um, I'm in my new environ, see? Tom, Tom banished me from the. He, ban, he literally banished me from the bedroom, and I am now in the second bedroom. So. Well, as well he should. I think. I think you know, professional work and streaming should not happen where you <laughs> exactly. sleep with your partner. We we can't read your screen in the closet doors like we could in the glass uh, I, door, I though. I know, and I echo. Now you we could be doing anything. I echo. So any transitions in ahead for you in 2012, Doctor? Yes, yes. Well, I have applications out to, I don't know, six or so colleges for professor-type jobs. Um, but those don't start until April. So in the meantime, um, I'm working with a consulting firm in California. And that just may be my new home. I may but, but, end up. But you just said the W word. I know. I know. They kind of like you to who, do that when they give you money for some reason. For those who haven't why. been paying attention, since we have known Jennifer, she hasn't actually been employed anywhere. So this well, is a very, very big deal. 
Because you were true. in your I mean, master's I have, program. I, I have had J-O-Bs while I've been in school, but um, you're right. I haven't had a full-time like job. Like working at the right. library and, you know, being a barista <laughs> at Starbucks don't really exactly. count, Jen. This is See, like they, real work, doing real stuff. So what are you doing? I, 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 I think company? the opposite. <laughs> I, I think the barista is <laughs> the real work. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so that, that's what I, that's what I'm doing. So what are you going to be doing at 9 a.m. tomorrow? Um, 9 a.m. tomorrow. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Should I be somewhere? Well, actually, thought, tomorrow is, is Luther King Day. Oh, I thought you were saying that you had to um, uh, do something tomorrow. Go to your home office at nine. No. I well, I'm spectrum. in it. Uh, this is this is my home office, um, but no, not tomorrow specifically. No, okay. nothing, nothing of interest tomorrow. And, and you, I did. I missed. I th so I heard part of Dave's. I did not hear John or Jeff. No, we haven't what heard about Shinker World. What's new in Shinker World? Uh, he's having Apparently some audio not much. issues. <laughs> Apparently, some audio issues are. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, I got a new salad spinner. I'm pretty excited about that. It's working <laughs> That's really well. A, I, knew, I was going to ask if anyone got new technology, but I guess you just answered <laughs> oh, that question. Oh, actually, I have a, I'm going back to the States in a couple of weeks. What and, for? Uh, my bi-yearly tour. Oh, but uh, I thought your, your wife just got home. She's getting home in five days. So and she's coming home in five days, home. and then in two weeks you're going I'm, I'm 11 days after that, I'm leaving. For 18 mm. days, and then because we want to leave in six, <laughs> 11 days after her return, I go. Um, uh, and anyway, there's some nice new technology waiting for me at home, including a nice, uh, lovely uh -huh. Asus laptop and a camera, a proper camera. I, I, I wanted to upgrade my video camera possibilities, and when I looked around, really, digital DSLRs are a very viable option, so I'm gonna. Pick that up wow. along with a Kindle. Ta -da. And so why are you waiting? Oh, look, and there's Dave's. That's what Dave's ah. okay. new purchase is. That's exciting. It's my new technology. Mm -hmm. um, can I just ask, though, back to Jeff, why why are you waiting to come here to buy your technology? It's cheaper. Oh. Hmm. Go figure. Yeah. Um, Dave, so when you I have to check that box that says, I will not export this out of the United States, you don't check that? Say, yes, I'm taking this to Korea? I never saw just... a box. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what box of wood. And, we, and we've never Disney. had this conversation. I don't know what you're talking right. about. It's certainly not right. going to record this or post it anywhere. <laughs> the, new the new house is summer all the time, by the way, to answer it's, your question, that's Jen. That's awesome. That's super. Right. The grass is always green. This is the other side. I still see the wow. same side. Yep. All yeah. the other side. No, no, no. It's the, the other side of the road where the grass is always green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. I got uh, you. I got you. Uh, right. Tom and I went to the RV show today because we might need another RV this year. So Yay. maybe we'll have a new. Maybe we'll have a new home by the end of the year too. So we never did hear about Shinker World. Yeah, what's going on with Shinker? About my your world. Audio, your audio wasn't working. Uh, my world is very much the same. Um, not not a whole lot going on technology wise at at school we are um, working on planning for educational change I, I finally got my principal or my a couple of my principals my superintendent my curriculum director my um, my boss who is the human resources or human yeah human resources director all kind of on the same page with personal learning networks and excited about uh, next generation skills and and like really moving the district forward and and getting beyond just preparing kids to take standardized tests and so looking at you know how has society changed in the last generation or so and then what do we need to do to prepare our students and so they're, they're looking at big picture questions and we're kind of struggling with how do we That's move awesome. as a school district into uh, this new world and and how do we bring the teachers along and and get people to embrace this vision so a lot of work ahead especially in you know within the community within the teaching staff with our parents just trying to get everybody on the same page regarding what is it that y'all want us to do 
and how should we be preparing our students for the future and then how do we go about doing that so lots of big questions for this year lots of discussions coming up um, hopefully moving much of the conversation away from technology and gadgets and toward learning and then supporting that learning with the appropriate tools so lots of uh, optimistic ex things happening that that sounds like a good thing and it do you think that's a typical of school systems these days or are in general they're coming around if not what's so special about your district that they're thinking that? I, we reached a tipping it's john point this year that's it, what i was thinking yeah well of course <laughs> it's it's john right um i i don't know I, I showed a couple videos you know i showed a michael wesh video to the administrative staff and we had a conversation about it i showed a will richardson video to the administrative staff we had a conversation about it um i bought a couple books actually physical books and mm. pass them around to administrators and the reason I bought the I bought Chris Lehman's new book on on uh, web 2.0 tools and uh, Will Richardson's book on personal learning networks and oh, I the reason too. I bought the reason I bought the actual books is because I wanted to give them to you know curriculum directors administrators and superintendents and have them pass them along to other people and that was the easiest way to do it, especially for people who don't aren't all on the same platform with digital books. So I can hand you a book and say, read this, and they'll read it, and then they can give it to somebody else and let them read it, and then uh, kind of spark some conversations that way. So that, that seemed to work pretty well. Um, and so when you're saying you were getting them interested in the personal learning networks, you mean to begin with like the teachers as like a professional development type thing, you mean, versus well, teachers, getting the kids? Well, teachers are in PLCs already. Um, but I, I just mean from the perspective of connecting to a wider world and finding other people beyond the people that I interact with on a daily basis in, in my work environment, uh, you know, using the, the social media tools, using Twitter, using blogs, you know, getting out into the wider world and finding other people who are facing similar challenges and trying to work together with them. Right, how? It's um, you know that's still I mean it's something that we all do and have been doing for a long time but it's it's very new uh, to a lot of our teachers. One new thing this year is that we actually have people watching the show <laughs> live <laughs> and hanging out in the chat room, uh, and I wanted to address some of the chat uh, comments. One very nice sleigh bed, Dave, that you were showing. Is that mm -hmm. actually your bed, or you were just showing you get us to the keep room? It. Interestingly enough, we have a sleigh bed to replace that one with. Oh. Um, yeah, but uh, no, that the little red slide. box was where I'll be doing my work for most of the next, well, whenever I'm out here at my work, that little deck off the uh, bedroom. Oh, that's yeah, that's nice. And to well, answer, chilly right now, though. Bit chilly right now, bit chilly right now. To answer Benjamin's question, is Google Hangout live, live? No, uh, this is pseudo live. This is, they, they have not implemented the live streaming or the recording yet. Uh, at least not for anyone I know. Uh, When's that happening, Jeff? Have you called people like over there? Do they know that you're interested? <laughs> yeah, you call them over there. Those, those Google you know, people. I'm less concerned about it for myself than I am for others, because I oh. am live, yeah. live. But I would love for see. other people, especially participants in this very show, to be hmm. able to do that. That would be lovely. Yeah, that would yeah. be interesting. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> yeah. Um, so what did I miss? What did you do in the first nine minutes that I was rebooting? That was it? I was babbling. Dave? So really it was the same thing that you heard at the <laughs> okay. end of when I was talking, except I said it again earlier. Oh, God, it was more of the same. Got it, got it. Pretty got much. It. Okay. Pretty much. So do we have a show format in 2012? Yeah, or what's do, our new format? Up? Don't we need some <laughs> angst? It's January. I think we need to talk about format. This is it. It's just us hanging out, talking about stuff. So I actually, um, you know, I think I would, I do have a couple things I'd just like to, to toss out there. Do you mind? Oh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so to, um, to begin with, I'll pick up where John left off saying that the teachers, you know, it seems like we've been talking about this for years, yet there are a lot of people out there that aren't quite, you know, familiar with some of these things. So where, what is the status of the adoption curve on all this. You know, I keep thinking, gosh, we've been talking about the same things for years. We have nothing new to talk about. Yet people seem to go, wow, that's cool. I've never heard of such a thing. Well, so what do you I'll guys you, think? Where are we at? 
I was, uh, Bonnie and I got invited back, which is nice, to speak to the Department of Education for PEI this year about social media. Last year, when we started talking about it, um, we asked a bunch of questions to the crowd to say, you know, well, what have you, essentially just trying to get a sense of how much sort of adoption there was. And I would say this year, especially if you count the people who tried it and decided they didn't like it, at least double um, the adoption in terms of, and particularly people's understanding of the words we were using. So when we said Twitter or whatever, right. there was recognition. Whereas even last year, I've noticed in last year, there's been a huge, huge change. At the university, the same is true. Um, I wouldn't even say so much with the faculty as it is with the students. The difference in the social media adoption among students is, uh, is huge. And again, when I talk about it um, as adoption in this case, I mean people's willingness to talk to people they don't already know. And I think that that's one of the big markers of, of adoption is the fact that they're using it to actually do something other than what, it's not just the convenience, it's actually something different. Where I think the way that most people use um, Facebook is actually not all that different. Realistically, all they're doing is talking to the same people they would be talking to if they happen to be in the same house with them. Um, but I think that's starting to slowly change too, at least in my experience. Yeah, and I think um, Facebook, and again, totally anecdotal, anecdotal in my personal little, little world here. I have all my family, I think, pretty much at this point is on Facebook. I can't really think of hardly anybody that's not. And I think that helps, even though, like you said, they're still talking to each other, they're not really branching out. You kind of still get the idea, you know, understand like you post and then people may or may not read it. And then, you know, people maybe from high school will see it. You know, I think there's that's somehow helping. To bridge that gap to the other world, mm -hmm. I think that is a big differentiation, though, and, and I'm glad you framed it that way, Dave. The, the idea of interacting with people you don't already know online is very different. Like among our students, Twitter is very popular, but it's popular uh, to communicate with their circle of friends, and so they don't see it as me broadcasting to the world. It's me broadcasting to you know, these 25 people who follow me who I also know and go to the same school and, um, you know, run in the circles. So, you know, using social media as a tool to communicate with people that I already know face to face is one thing. Uh, I think it's very different and much more unusual for people to reach out and make connections to people that they don't already know. Um, and difficult to do that, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's your 21st century literacy. If you feel the need to use that example, that is, that is where it is. Hmm. Um, as, a, as an institution, I think we are moving toward more acceptance of, of digital media, of, of uh, social media, of letting go of, of some of the, the constraints and the control that we've, we've always had. Um, we see more people allowing access to YouTube, for example, more people ac allowing access to Facebook. I think at the district, school district level, we are um, embracing Twitter and to some extent embracing Facebook, but still using them in the old world models of this is a method for disseminating information. So we end up with a Twitter account for the school that you know we send out updates on but there's nobody really listening. So if people reply to that, uh, strange things can happen. And I think the same is true with Facebook. Um, so institutionally, I think we still have a lot of work to do there. And I think the chat, some of the comments that are coming in are completely uh, appropriate to what we're talking about. Uh, it's one thing to know how to use something like Google Hangout and quite another to feel comfortable talking to people who have opposing views or those you don't know. No, it isn't. And. Um, <laughs> No, Great you know what? Chat. People Great go you. people go crazy with audio and video recording still. And it's something that you know, we've gotten over cuz we know Jeff. But you know, the idea that uh, I'm going to record a conversation changes that conversation in in any school. Um, we have teachers who are very concerned about students with with recording devices, either video or audio. Um, people don't like being on camera. Um, it, it it really changes the conversation. There's there's a really uh, a hesitancy there to participate if this is there's going to be a record of this. Yeah, they better get used to it. 
No, no, no argument, but it's still. Where to ask a question similar to Jen's, where are we at with the adoption of openness? And that's kind of related to the, the sharing of conversations. You know, I, I still, even open projects aren't, you know, necessarily using open tools and or um, making their content as openly available as possible. I think that battle continues. I think that there's a, a lot of money, I mean, companies, I mean, money, invested in that not working out. Um, so I think that that battle is still going back and forth. I wouldn't say that there's any uh, concerted attempt to foster openness. Um, there are people who are spending money on it. Um, there are people who are um, spending money opposing it. And uh, I mean, th like I say, we talked about this a bit before the show. There's a lot of problems administratively with something like openness. You know, it's really hard to convince people that editing is a necessary process when they're not being paid. Um, it's really hard to convince them to go back and refer you know, I had this conversation, I have this conversation at least once a month with somebody on campus where they'll say, I want to start this open project where we're going to put up all these resources and people are going to come and use them and they're going to contribute. And it's, it's the same project every time. And I say, who is going to be the person who's going to go back it's really easy to start, but who's the person who's going to go back and edit this and find the broken links and make sure that the spam gets kept out and all the rest of those things. And I think because of the project management necessities of print, of the sort of big money projects, the open projects are still not being run, broadly speaking, are not being run in such a way that they're getting a good reputation at all. And I think that, that that's a real concern. I see uh, from our teachers a willingness to collaborate with one another and to share resources and collect resources uh, without necessarily going completely open. And I don't see us, for example, stopping the purchase of textbooks or anything in the near future um, or, or deciding not to purchase content from content suppliers of, of various varieties. What I do see from teachers is that they're more willing to work with one another. You know, I, I'm teaching a particular topic, and there are seven other teachers in the school who teach the same thing. Let's share some of our resources and some of our ideas. Now they're looking for better tools to do that. Um, and and one of their frustrations is how do I organize all of this stuff? If I'm teaching chemistry, I might have you know 25 different resources related to covalent bonds. And uh, I, I might organize those in Delicious or in Digo or somewhere. Uh, maybe I just have bookmarks and, and you know I have some way that I can share those with the other teachers. But then I also need a way to organize those in a way that I can present them to students. And so I want them to use these three resources and not these twenty-five. And and so like is there a go-to place for that? Like you know you think of you you want basic information about something you go to Wikipedia and that's open. Right. Uh, Wiki textbooks, I don't know, or, or whatever that thing is, OER. Yeah, I mean, there are some some of those. Um, but I think in, in our school, we're just trying to find what's going to fit well um, and, and is loose enough that it can apply to anything. Wiki textbooks are, are pretty spotty, especially at K-12. You know, there's a lot of computer science, a lot of business, um, a lot of... Uh, uh, say first two years of college kinds of things, but not a lot of like sixth grade. Um, I have I've given out a bunch of links to people and said here try this maybe this will work, but I I don't think we've reached a critical mass anywhere. Pearl trees seems interesting, um, you know things like Scoop it, um, you know Live Binders, that, those sorts of tools to just try to organize resources and and collect them in a way that makes sense for the teachers. Yeah, but that's just another bundle of links really. There's no yeah, filtering true. or presentation. Well, it's filtering and annotating in, in the way that, that they're doing it. I mean, I guess the other side is we could use Moodle for that, but then you're recreating it or at least remixing it each time you're teaching the course. You know, we, we were talking about uh, OERU on a recent 
cool cast or something and they're they're doing it this semester i think they've got 15 courses rolling out and they're doing it in a way where here's the course here are all the materials the member universities are handling the credit portion of it um which seems like a model that could actually work um, yeah, I was I was talking to some people recently. To, I think I was um, in October, no, late November. I was talking to David Wiley, and he'd been working with some of them uh, to find out what it is. And it really is a, like a PLAR model on steroids, I guess, where they've gotten, as you said, a host of universities signed up to basically agree to the same criteria, not necessarily the same criteria for assessment, but just kind of in in concept, saying, yeah, we'll let you bring your own knowledge however you attain it and then we'll you know accredit it um, or give you credit for the experience so it'll be interesting to see you know how that because it, it'll really I think depend on how they do the assessment and if it's you know consistent across colleges and within the university are you getting the same I guess the same degree will people there be a perception that you have a different degree than if you went the traditional route you know all those. Will there be an asterisk? And <laughs> you know, I, I, I still asterisk. find, speaking of asterisks, I still find myself surprised how much people still feel like online learning isn't real learning and doesn't oh, count really? as much. Oh, really? Yeah. You're kidding me. I've never heard I don't heard know if you're familiar before. with that. I don't know if you've no, heard anything like that. No, I've never had anyone ever say anything like that. But I, I really am surprised that people, a lot of people in the face-to-face -face programs just think it's not as valid. How can they think that, Jen? Um, I don't know. You know, it's funny, too, because I have my own, you know, we all have, uh, you know, perceptions and bias of different things. And um, for some reason, for me, I like to, I, I feel better about programs that I have a brick and mortar location. Isn't, so that's my own bias. So that's a bad thing, I think. <laughs> I'm sure, sure there are a lot of people out there going, hey, I got a great degree from Capella or Walden or wherever, and I'm sure it is a great degree. But I think it's just going to take a long time for those perceptions. What you, I think, when more and more and more people get those degrees, and you start to have a better appreciation and understanding for what is behind them, it will help. I'm sorry. Do you, did you, you think, think the you age of are I'm, biased toward brick and mortar? I am. I, meaning that, like, for example, when I was looking for uh, for both my master's and my PhD looking for a program at a distance, I first looked at programs that had very, very solid, uh, you know, brick and mortar um, programs where they had faculty on site, a good library, a good, you know, all the back stuff, backroom stuff that was, I, I was able to look at and kind of look at their track record. That was important to me. Maybe in 10 years that won't be, or five years or whatever the amount of time is, maybe it won't be as important. but. It seemed, I guess, less fly by night because <laughs> they actually. Do you, well, do you think the age of the space. institution has something to do with that? I mean, yeah. you know, would a sure. would a brick and mortar university that's only been around for five or six years be absolutely more acceptable than an online? I think you're right. I think it was. It probably was more just the longevity, and then being able to point to people, faculty that I was able to kind of dig into their background and see what they were all about. That I mean, certainly it. you could have that with an online school in terms sure. of the faculty and, and in terms of the resources. But to say, you know, I know Indiana University has been here for 150 years or whatever, and Old Dominion's been there for 450 years or whatever. And so you have an institution that is pretty stable and has a reputation, and that that's part of that degree. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, Jen's doctoral school. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, she's running out of out of her new office there. And you know, they at the end of the day, they're practical considerations. You're spending a lot of time and, and a lot of money on it, and you want people to appreciate it. So I think, um, you, even though it stinks, and I get mad when people say it's a, it's different and whatever they say, it's reality, and its perceptions become reality. So. Hmm. I mean, what do you guys think? Would you? caution someone or if someone came to you would you what, what would you ask them about um, the school that they were planning on attending? I think it's you know it's okay to question the merit of the program be it online or brick and mortar 
you know, there are lousy brick and mortar programs, there are lousy online programs. And I agree with the chat room that the, the brick and mortar in a way requires less responsibility. I think a learner has to be more self-motivated and is self-directed with an online program. And I think those are 21st century skills. I think learning online and having to, to do all that is a 21st century literacy. A big I, part of this, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm rambling. Go ahead and finish. Okay, a big part of this is why are you getting the degree to begin with? Um, uh, you know, we, we are all lifelong learners and we're all participating in, uh, in these learning networks and we're doing MOOCs and we're doing all of this stuff that, that we're using to better ourselves and better our professional lives. But if we're going to the step of having to do a degree or deciding to do a degree, I want to have, uh, the paper that says that I have done this work then I'm doing that for a reason, either doing it to get a better job or because you know someone is expecting that. I, I need some proof. And depending on who I'm going to give that proof to that I've done this learning, uh, that proof is going to need to be different. So if I'm trying to impress an employer or I'm trying to impress an institution that I want to hire me, then I, I want to have a degree that they're not going to just look at and say, oh, yeah, well, you, you printed that out online or you know, that shows that you know how to use Photoshop or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think if you're trying to be in this institution and play in the higher education game, then you need to be in that institution and play the higher education game. No? I think, you know, we've talked about this before. I think Dave, um, who was it that was going to do his create his own PhD? Um, was it Lee? What was it? Lee Blackall? Lee who was Blackall. It? Um, and we talked about it then, and, and we were kind of going back and forth on different aspects of it. And something I kind of liked when I was going, I mean, why, I get asked a lot, why, why, are you, why did you even bother? Because you can get, I, I've said it many, many times, I get more out of Friday night or Sunday nights here rather than <laughs> probably any class I've, I've, ever, I've ever, ever had. Um, but there's just something for me for having someone who's familiar with the domain to set a bar for you and then kind of lead you along the path. And I think that's kind of where I lost a little bit with Lee's idea because I think you don't know what you don't know. And so for me, I was yeah. that's why I was so interested in finding a program that had faculty I was interested in and that they had a good reputation and things like that because I thought they were going to set a bar that would be worthy of my spending time, you know, trying to achieve it. But you know, that was my did critique they? of his his thought. Did did they? Definitely. Yep. Yep. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. They were awesome. Absolutely awesome. So, couldn't have been happier. Yeah, and really, and that's the distinction, right? And so, John's point about credentialism makes perfect sense. Um, but at the same time, um, you indenture yourself to a PhD for a reason. Hopefully, that reason isn't just the credentialing. And for some people, that's enough. Um, I think that the bar setting isn't the sort of thing that needs to be. It's not what everybody is looking for. I don't think that Lee would perform particularly well inside of that environment. Um, he <laughs> he he's a bit he he has his own attitude and his own way of, about things, and I'm I'm um, sympathetic to that because it's my one the biggest reason I'm not in a PhD program is I've yet to find one that suits my particular personality um, and really shortcomings. They're not. I don't think of that as a positive thing. It's just I would struggle in that scenario. Uh, but if you're looking for that kind of mentorship, then I think it makes perfect sense because these people are professionals and they have been through that and they do, you, you save the 10 years of wandering and four years of working with people who can give you the directions. Right? And there's something really valuable about that. And, and there, <laughs> toward the end, you know, I kept saying my dissertation, it's just one giant independent study project and really they're paid to be your mentor <laughs> and as much as we all like each other I don't think any of us would spend the amount of time my advisor did with me just because we like each other as far as critique and you know it's their job and I'm you know they're being paid to do it and there's something yeah. unfortunately you kinda have to pay the person to do that at some point if you really want <laughs> them to spend their Saturday mornings going through pages and pages of your writing absolutely mm-hmm Yep, for sure. And so, and that's that's what it comes down to, right? And in this scenario, what we have to go back to the conversation that we were having at the beginning, in this scenario, you have a very clear idea of what it is you're looking for from an education system. And that's not the general situation, right? I don't think that people uh, 
certainly not the vast majority of people I talk to, they go to get an education as if somehow going there gives them knowledge that they need to go out and do stuff. And realistically, I think that the things that I'm guessing, and Jen, you can tell me if I'm wrong, the things that you were taught are not things you could write down and hand off to someone else. It's more of an indentureship. It's more of mentorship. It's sort of bits and pieces and sort of slowly coming to an understanding of what being a professional, being an expert in that field is all about, which is something you can really only do either through trial and error or with somebody having someone guide you with their own right. professionalism. And, and fighting, and I think you've talked about this on, as far as the peer review process, just fighting for your idea. Um, you know, it really, it, it's a huge um, gift someone gives you when they critique your work and then when they're willing to sit there when you disagree and fight with mm -hmm. you and yeah. it's you know that, that's the I, the beauty of informal learning is you can reach a lot of people and you can see a lot of ex ideas but it's that depth that I rarely see unless <laughs> it's a more formalized and that could just be my experience I mean do, maybe do you feel like the value of that experience. matters whether it's online or face-to-face -face? oh no no, and I just clarified the chat room. I mean, I make myself sound like I'm, you know, I'm just, just kind of playing the devil's advocate on some of the distance learning things, what, what some of my, you know, bi my bias and different things. But um, I f firmly believe I had more face-to-face -face time with my advisor via Skype than I ever would have if I had been on campus, no doubt about it. So. More face-to-face -face time. Yeah. So, uh, any other New Year thoughts or updates? It's been a while since we've we've been here. Dave, you've hosted a number of Change 11. Even though it's 2012, it's still called Change mm -hmm. 11. You did a session yeah, with Howard Rheingold. That. And, that was and fun. Others. He's smart. He's, he's a lot of fun. He's smart, but he doesn't smile or laugh that much. You kept making your funny comments, and he's like, mm-hmm. Yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> he doesn't get you the way we get you, Dave. So that was that was fun. I enjoyed doing that. Um, like I say, I'm I'm getting prepped for this crazy thing in India in the middle of March, um, and sort of trying to pull my work together for that. What's the thing um, in India? I don't know about the thing in India. There's a thing in India. I'm going to. India. Dave's going to a thing in India. I didn't hear about the India thing. Origin, Did you already talk? Do I have to listen? I have to listen to the first five minutes. You have to read the Skype chat. Oh, good luck with that. Okay. Sorry. I'll just type the. URL in here. Yeah, um, My... it's one of those things that I um, get to come along and play on. So it, uh, <laughs> I speak fourth that day. It's single stream uh, for the three days. I speak fourth. It's George, Stephen, J. Cross, and then me. So, mm -hmm. so you're going to tie it all <laughs> together then. Wrap it all up. Little neat bow. Could be. Could be. Uh huh. I would. Uh, wow. It's you can't gay. be first, huh? Yeah. I I think first would be best there because then. Come on, Alex, there. You know, oh, it's like a, Steven, a bunch of people. Stephen yeah. gets to ask the questions, right? And then you guys have to find some resolution. Something like that. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it'll be an interesting one, and it's. Uh, I, I, that's why I've decided that it's time for me to start focusing because realistically these opportunities aren't going to keep falling out of the sky. And um, I spent too much time speaking broadly about the industry and not enough time speaking about the things that I'm actually the most passionate about. So um, I'm going to act like a professional and see if people believe it. Might that include a book, a speaking tour, we're gonna, conference we're circuit? See Cormier Comet 2012 on Amazon Nick, this year? Book is the big one I've got to get done. Um, and I just I don't know if I have it in me or not. I'm still sort of trying to work that out. But it's it's really the only uh, other than than doing the PhD. Uh, it's really the only route from where I am now to the next step. So if I'm going to continue down the path that I've sort of fallen into, and you know six publications and that's all nice and everything, but and I've sort of enough of that work done now to go. Oh look, I'm a sort of there are people there are a couple of people out there who are using my work in their courses and, and so that that step has been made but whether or not I'm willing to put the effort in to make it to the next level whether I can is a different thing entirely but whether or not I'm willing to put in the efforts the big question I really yeah, think in the back channel John is suggesting about. short chapters I suggest lots of pictures I'm curious 
How might you publish this? Is this going to be a standard academic Oof. publication? Is this going to be some open, yeah. interactive thing? Let, let me try to write it first. The how am I going to publish it's the least of my worries. Um, the how am I going to focus for 200 pages is the big problem. Well, don't you want the community um, to help you write it? Shiny. If the community is the curriculum, Squirrel. isn't the community the book? <laughs> <laughs> Tempting. Um, yeah, I don't think that would work. Um, and I think that that's, I mean, that's, that's always the, that's always the conflict. I mean, what, what exactly, why do you write a paper? Why would you bother? What's the difference between a paper and a blog post? Is it just the format? Is it just a call back to a pastime? I don't think so. I, I think of it more as a speech, um, and getting a chance to put all the ideas in, in order so that somebody can take it and take their time with it and try to get a sense of what you're trying to I say. I don't know. I think if you can and embed it, rhizomatic it. process into how the book is produced, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah, it would be. It would be. But then I'd be working with clowns like you guys who'd be constantly <laughs> in there changing the text on it. You are the gardener, man. Garden. Yeah. 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 He's going to start by doing a whole lot of weeding. <laughs> and I mean, there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that that I'm trying to um, that I'm trying to pull together. Um, you know, that I've been talking or, or thinking recently, I got to write a blog post that might happen tonight about habituation and how it separates from, and there's all this stuff that, and they're all ideas that I need to unpack. And it, it's just going to take a long time. And the book format will allow me to say, okay, so about habituation, this is what I mean about it. And that's going to take a chapter at least, you know, and this is what I think it means. And this is how I think it interacts with this stuff. And then there's all this. There's like 10 ideas like that that I really need. You guys have heard me babble about this stuff. It takes me forever to get it out. But, but I, I really think you should plant the seed of each chapter online. Let the community engage you with it. <laughs> Come on. Walk, have you read that the, the New York Times article? I got to grab that. My, the New York Times article, it said that uh, innovation and creativity, you know, where does it stem from the individual or the group? And there's a whole backlash on the group. So Designed by committee. <laughs> Might we well, be seeing no a book from Dr. Madril? A book for me? No. Oh, this weekend I had an idea. We that we I thought after I read actually it was Will's book. I was like, we could do this. We 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 could do the EdTech Weekly version of um of Will's book. I've had suck kind of when what, you read all these books and think I could have written this. I've had five or six people tell me that we're crazy not to have written an EdTech an EdTech talk EdTech Weekly book, that we could get it done in like a month. Yeah. And and they're not wrong. Probably. I know. I had the chapters in my head. I mean, I was like, <laughs> well, here's what my thought. We want to hear what my thought was, and you can Good. tell me if I'm crazy. I thought we could write it like we do it, where one person kind of comes up with a topic and, like, does a blurb. And then the other, it's basically then uh, three other rebuttals to what the person said. Either, like, cool or you're full of crap. <laughs> Google Doc, Jen. Set it up. We'll do it. I, I know. What would the chapters be? No, you already have them in your head. Go ahead and, do, and write them. I, I did have a bunch of them. Put now the I headings in. See, that was after I had a couple. Of, oh. I was dr drinking that at that point. I can't one, remember. One, that one more topic. <laughs> one more topic of discussion before the end of the show that I'd like to bring up. EdTech Talk had its first uh, chat explosion. Oh, I caught the end oh. of it. What happened? Yeah. I just got the end of it. It was very exciting. Um, I had this sort of message pop up on my screen saying, "Please, please, please, shut down the chat." And I'm like. What, is it burning you with fire? <laughs> what um, so I, I went in and looked around, and, and, and I think, I don't know if it was John or Jeff pointed out that my attempts at administrating didn't make it clear enough to the people I was administrating that I was an administrator, uh, which is fair enough. But I tried to say, hey, can we just slow this down for a second? And then was pleaded with three or four more times to turn off the chat. So The, I just the phrase you used was, we are committed to positive discourse. And what the situation, to provide some context, there was a guest on a show uh, who has his project, and there were a number of people. It was not one crazy rogue psycho. It was a bunch of people saying, oh, yeah, what about this claim and that claim and financial impropriety and, and whatever else? And they weren't getting any response. And so Dave, the man, came in and shut down the chat. So and that doesn't sound so bad. I mean, what what was the what was the negative discourse, or what was I, the? I, I really w wasn't reading much of it. I was only responding. The truth is, is the show host probably should have had control of the chat room. So in my mind, it was up to them to decide whether or not they wanted it turned off. So I just went, okay, you want to turn it off? We'll turn it off. 
Yeah, so I mean, I, I, agree. I don't really know. I, I would defer to the show host. Yeah, but that's as, what I did. As, as an, and I'd love to have sort of an ed tech talk community discussion about this. I'm not especially committed to positive discourse. I'm committed to genuine civil, civil discourse. Yeah. Civil, right. And, you know, if I, I thought it was a missed opportunity, frankly, because, you know, this guy has a project that he spent a lot of time on. And apparently there are more than a few or at least a few people who have serious, legitimate. They weren't being especially rude. They were being passionate. They were feeling wronged. Um, and I know if I was in that situation and someone was in a chat room saying, yeah, World Bridges cheated me, blah, 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 I would not be able to help myself but respond. And there seemed to be no interest in doing that. Well, was it a, a matter of the guest can't, I mean, like, I can't do two things at once. I can't talk and read a, something at the same time. Is that, was that the issue or they were just going, I'm not responding to this crap on the... I'm yeah, guessing I'm the sorry. latter. I mean, yes, it's hard oh. to follow, but it wasn't hard to get the gist of what was being said. Oh. And I, looking at the timestamps, it looked like all of that happened within like three or four minutes. Is that true? No, it started from the very beginning of the show. More people joined in along the way, and I'd say okay. 20 to 25 minutes of it was happening okay, in the so chat I, room and not being addressed at all. Okay. I it seemed to me like the whole thing had started really before they started the show and then about five minutes into the show they were done but um i, I may have been misreading that timestamps are a little bit off if you notice now our timestamps in the chat room are about nine minutes slow i don't know if that's that server time or something. yeah that is weird is that our server yes server time is probably wrong yep the elf will look into that yeah but but hey um, New new 2012 thing is our little chat room here. How's it going with the chat? I notice when you click on a link, it opens it in the chat, huh? That's that's the one remaining task for the elves. Uh, people need to right click, open a new tab. Um, gotcha. Uh, but it's you know it's it's a lot lighter than the old add-on chat. It works. You can paste links. Um, and what's the admin um, piece of it? You can boot and things like that. Yep. If you're logged in as an editor, you can ban or kick users. Oh. It's tied uh, into Drupal. It is running on our closely server. than than it is a Drupal list. module called Chat Room based on PHP Chat. Uh, we had more than seventy people in it for the Evo launch webcast, and server did not flinch. Oh, speaking of which, I do want to plug Evo before we uh, go. This is the yearly um, online oh, wow. free workshops for. Um, uh, language teachers and it's it's awesome I did an open hangout last night and we went into Second Life and then we did uh, a Petcha Flicker with Scott Lockman and it's just awesome there's more than a thousand people participating this year what? yeah like on um, like not live not live no but oh. there's 14 different sessions and um, just truly global last night we had you know, Sudan, Morocco, Brazil, wow, um, awesome. Croatia. Uh, so awesome stuff going on at webheadsinaction.org and links elsewhere. And, you know, one of the nice things about this is a couple of the groups, there's a digital tool session and Becoming a Webheads, and they do a really nice job of sampling all the latest tools, which, you know, we used to do back in the day with our link dumps. Uh, and I kind of miss that. I wouldn't mind having I a, a link dump we should, show. Sometime. We should have a link dump show, yeah. And they do a really nice job of trying out the latest things and seeing what works and providing little uh, demonstrations. Uh, so always worth tuning in. Speaking of which, uh, I've scheduled the Open Hangout Part 2 for the top of the hour. So on this stream and in this Hangout, we'll be adding people soon uh, for that. Oh, cool. It's in four minutes. Can I just say that I love the new format? <laughs> I do too. It's so radically different. It just show up and talk about whatever comes. Whatever to Dave's talk. Whatever Dave's thinking about this week. Uh, so I did Jeff, have a topic. Should we should we wrap this up? Yeah, we should. I. Oh, that's okay. If you have no, a topic, I, we could use it. You know, one of these other weeks. That well, we okay. I'll, I'll try to make it. I'll make it as quickly as I quick, quickly as I can. Uh, on Friday, we had the opportunity to watch a uh, whole bunch of new tools and technologies get kicked off, and at times was magical, and at many times was messy. And we've talked many, many times about the convergence of messy and magical. 
And I was wondering if we could somehow turn that into a discussion of how do you make experiences more magical and less messy as a, a teacher trying to integrate some of these fun tools we talk about. Like, mm -hmm. at what point do you go, you know, time out, folks, we're going to do this, or, you know. That. I want to bring props. <laughs> You were doing a good job making it magical, but it was very messy. So. That's it. Magical That's all I was going to say. versus messy. I love that thought. The convergence of messy and magical. That's what this whole thing... That's the title of our book. Ed Tech Weekly. Get it started. Google Doc. Google Doc. I think Doc. we're more messy than magical. I know, but sometimes it's so magical. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so why don't we go ahead and wrap things up. This has been EdTech Weekly 208, streamed live on January 15th, 16th. Uh, next week, I sure. don't know if I'm yeah. going to be available. My wife will be uh, returned. Oh. Oh. oh, it'll be magical there. Magical, yeah. Magical. Yes, don't, <laughs> yes. don't, <laughs> don't stream that, Jeff. No, don't worry. <laughs> I, uh, I will be staying away from the computer. Although she gets back Saturday night, so it's very possible she'll be sleeping at this time. Um, mm -hmm. So I might be available, mm -hmm. but I can't commit to that. So one of you other streamers might have to take over the duties. Somebody remind me how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. We'll help you with that, Dave. No problem.